from the Evergetinos, Volume 3, Hypothesis 1, that one should not condemn anyone on the basis of suspicions or, in general, give any credence to suspicions. Part 1. From the Life of St. John the Merciful. At that time, a certain monk was going around Alexandria with an attractive girl in tow. A number of church people saw him dragging this girl around with him and denounced him to the blessed John for allegedly giving scandal to many by keeping company with her. Led on by their words and supposing that they were motivated by divine zeal to make this accusation, the patriarch ordered that the monk and the girl be severely thrashed and then confined in separate dungeons. After the order had been carried out and the monk and the girl had been imprisoned, the monk appeared by night to the patriarch in a dream, showing him the wounds on his back and saying to him with simplicity and guilelessness, All right then, do these wounds please you, master? Believe me, at least this one time, even you have been deceived as a man. As soon as he awoke from sleep, St. John had the monk released from custody and sent for him, though on account of his many wounds the monk was scarcely able to walk. The saint looked at him closely and recognized him as the monk whom he had seen in his sleep. Wishing to find out whether the monk had, in fact, received as many wounds as he bore during his appearance in the dream, the patriarch ordered him to uncover his back after covering his loins with a towel. But when, by divine providence, the towel came undone and his private parts were exposed, Everyone saw that he was a eunuch, although, on account of his youth, he had previously not been able to avoid every suspicion. The patriarch immediately removed the monk's accusers from their ecclesiastical offices, suspending them for three years. He offered a fitting apology to the God-loving monk and asked his forgiveness for the sin that he had committed against him in ignorance. But, he told the monk, I cannot approve of the fact that, since you are a monk and appear so young, you go around cities indiscreetly with a woman in tow, thereby scandalizing many people. The monk replied with due respect and humility, Blessed be the Lord, Master. I assure you that I am not lying. Not many days previously I was in Gaza, and while I was on my way from there to venerate Saints Kiros and John, this girl met me towards evening. She fell at my feet, begging me to let her accompany me, since she wanted to become a Christian, for she was a Jew. Fearing the condemnation of God, who has commanded us not to despise any of his little ones, I listened to her plea and allowed her to accompany me. Moreover, I was confident that, given my physical condition, it would not be easy for the enemy to tempt me. After arriving there, that is, at the Church of the Holy and Mercenaries, and fulfilling my vow, I catechized her in the Christian faith. Ever since then, in simplicity of heart, I have kept her with me, supporting her by begging alms. I am eager to settle her, if possible, in a convent. After hearing this story, the blessed patriarch exclaimed in astonishment, My goodness, how many hidden servants of God there are, even though they remain unknown to us. He immediately offered the monk one hundred nomismata as a gift, but the latter declined to accept it, replying, If a monk has faith, he has no need of money. If he loves money at all, he is bereft of faith. After saying this, he kissed the patriarch's hand and departed. Then the patriarch advised those who were with him to avoid altogether making accusations against monastics, and he recalled an admirable remark made by the ever-memorable emperor St. Constantine, who rejected accusations which had been lodged against certain bishops at the First Ecumenical Synod of Nicaea, saying, If I came across a bishop or a monk committing fornication, I would take off my royal mantle and place it over him, lest anyone should see him sinning. And the patriarch continued, he knew well that the flaws of such people, monks and bishops, when disclosed to the masses, not only bring into disrepute ecclesiastical offices which are worthy of honor and respect, but, as well, become a great incentive and pretext for those seeking to justify their own vices through such bad examples. Henceforth, keeping the case of the eunuch monk vividly before the eyes of his soul, the admirable patriarch John paid no heed to the slanders against Vitalios the Great. And what happened to Vitalios? To learn what happened to Vitalius the Great, see part two of this series. We hope that you have been edified by this reading. To learn more about the Evergetinos and other publications by the Center for Traditionalist Orthodox Studies, please visit the link in the description box below.